Thunderhead by Mary O'Hara Chapter 4 Nell stood at the edge of the old sheepfold looking for mushrooms. In the spring she had picked lamb's quarters there, fresh young greens which, when cooked and chopped fine with salt and pepper and garlic and cream, were more delicious than any spinach. It grew where sheep had been. There were sheep in the ranch now. Rob had leased out some grazing and here was where the fold had been in the spring. A square place, bare of grass, fenced around with wire. When the sheep were there, lanterns hung on the four corners to scare away coyotes. But now the sheep had gone up to the back range and grass had grown over the fold. And often mushrooms grew there too. She quickly filled her basket. When she got back to the kitchen, she made the stuffing for the ducks, four of them. She was glad she could use up some of the young ducklings. They were so much better right now at about six months of age than later. The four small yellow corpses lay on the drain board of the sink. Tim had plucked them, but she must look over them again. With the point of a sharp knife, she dug out the pin feathers. She peeled potatoes, drew cold water and put them in murmuring to herself, plan for two o'clock. She had a great deal to do and hurried around the kitchen, her brown sandals light and quick on the green painted floor. Paulie sat in the middle of the room, from which spot she could, by turning her head rapidly, keep Nell in sight. Occasionally, this made her so dizzy that she fell over sideways with a little thump. Then she would pick herself up with bewildered shaking of her small head and again take to her seat and resume her adoration. Often, her eyes on Nell's face, she purred and kneaded the wooden floor under her paws. She was waiting for that moment when Nell, passing her, would suddenly stoop, sweep her up, hold her in front of her, shaking her a little, talking to her, then cuddle her a second and put her down and go on with her work. Paulie knew when these moments were coming, and as Nell approached her, she would run to her, stand upon her hind legs, and reach her arms up with sharp cries of ecstasy. Nell glanced at the clock and wondered where the men were. Whenever she thought of Rob, she could see him in her mind's eye, and could sometimes almost feel his force. She saw him now, riding, head up, frown between his eyes, suddenly, she felt compassion for him, and fear. The life here is so dangerous for everyone. Cliffs and mountains, horses, weather. She braced herself, her lips closed firmly. Happiness hangs by a hair. She went to the spring house, carrying a yellow bowl and a dipper. She removed the cover from the jar in the shallow tray of running water and dipped out the cream. So much for the mushrooms. So much for the apricot Bavarian cream. Easier to make than ice cream and just as good. Coming out of the spring house, she stood a moment, her eyes wandering over the blue hills of the far range and the slopes of tawny grass nearby. All the hardships of her life at the ranch were mitigated by the natural beauty around her. It was like an ever-present, harmonious accompaniment for with which... When she wished, she could fall in step and be comforted. A streak of heavenly colour cut the sunny air over the green. A bluebird with the light metallic on its wings. It perched on the tip of one of the cottonwood trees, swinging in the breeze. Nell had to smile, watching it. She turned her head to the gorge again and listened. The wind was coming down from the stables. It might carry the sound of a voice. Rob shouting, or a dog barking, whinny of a horse, but there was nothing. She went on to the house. When dinner was ready, all but the roasting of the ducks, she sat down sidewards in a chair by the window, folded her arms on the back, bent her head upon them and rested. Polly sat close beside her. She was remembering how, as he left the table that morning, Rob had laid his hand for one moment upon the top of her head. It was so gentle a touch that not one hair of her shining cap was disturbed. She knew what the caress meant.
He hated to leave her with all the work to do and blamed himself. There was always that hidden sweetness he had for her underneath the shouting and blustering, but not so often now as it used to be. She raised her head and looked out at the green, still the windy blue of the sky with the chicken hawks tilting and swinging. A file of red gold horses was walking slowly through the pines opposite. The sun touched their shining coats. There were vertical bars of gold flickering, alternating with bands of shadow. She bent her head and listened again. Still no sound from the stables. Rob, was he all right? All right in himself? All right about life? All right towards her? There was that thing he never ceased worrying about. It, if he had done right in bringing her here to the west, away from everything and everybody she had grown up with. Just the other night, they had been talking about it after the boys had gone to bed, taking his pipe out of his mouth, the smoke wreathing around his finely modelled dark hair. He said, I should never have brought you out here. Looking at him, she saw behind him across the green, the dark pines with their jagged outline against the placid, star-filled sky. Why not? There's something about the life here that's pretty hard to take, isn't there? I guess there's something pretty hard to take about life wherever you are. But this is downright primitive. Nell said dreamily, I remember when we used to go to California in the winters, crossing the plains, I would look from the train windows and see all the uninhibited land, with here and there a pitiful looking huddle of buildings against the sky all their lines off the square, and looking as if they were about to collapse, usually clinging to the side of a windmill. And it gave me the most terrible feeling, despair really, at the thought of such a life for anyone. Just winds and emptiness and unmeasurable miles, and a crooked tumble-down jumble of boards, home, in the midst of it. Such loneliness. I could almost taste and smell it right there in the Pullman, looking out the window. And now, here I am. And now I know that very likely some of those buildings I saw were the centre of a ranch of anything from two to ten thousand acres, and that in the middle of the jumble of corrals and fences and outbuildings and crooked walls was a real house, weather tight and cosy inside, crowded with homely furniture, red-hot stoves in winter, big families, clustering children, Old people, booted men, noise, food, good cheer. I've been in many of them. They aren't lonely and forlorn at all. Rob was aggrieved. There isn't a single wall off the square on this ranch. Oh, Rob, I didn't mean our home. This is beautiful. You made it beautiful. I couldn't have a lovelier home. Honest? You know it. He puffed in silence for a few moments. And yet... Nell, it could have been in the east. Will this ever be home to you? Rob, if you go away from your own place and people, the place you spent your childhood in, all your life you'll be sick with homesickness and you'll never have a home. You can find a better place, perhaps a way of life you like better, but the home is gone out of your heart and you'll be hunting it all your life long. You must feel that as well as I. Out of a deep silence, his answer came. I do. It makes me quite desperate sometimes. And so, she had leaned to him and slipped her hand in his. Here, this, your hand is home for me. He had clasped her hand with sudden violence. Rob's hands, they were big, square-fingered hands, the veins standing out full and hard so that you thought of the blood pushing within them and the pounding pulse. For all their size and hardness, they were finely drawn hands, significant. Hands a sculptor would choose to hold a torch. Hands a horse would choose to bridle him. Thinking about them, she saw them detach from Rob. Two little persons, moving about of themselves with a will and a brain of their own, always doing something, carrying tools, pieces of metal, odds and ends of machinery or leather or wire, making the terrace, laying the low stone wall which held it, planting the flower border beneath it, making the stone fountain in the middle of the green, 
planting and watering the cottonwood trees. He spoke again out of the darkness, for she had gone so far away in thought, knowing nothing but the clasp of his hand and the smell of his tobacco-scented nearness, that she drew herself back with difficulty. But the boys now, yes, this is home for them, oh yes, but will they stay here or wander away as we did, and then be homeless too? She answered passionately, as long as they live, they'll never forget these skies and storms and rainbows and storms and fiery elements. That's just it. We were born and brought up in the cities and escaped. To this, it will be just the opposite with the boys. It's the way with everybody nowadays. They had mused and talked about the poetry, which is the pulse beat of the living earth. Here on the ranch, one lived right on the naked body of nature. In the cities, nature is encased in a shell. One cannot feel the warmth, the blood. One almost comes to doubt its life. In cities, indeed, one can be utterly lost. For an hour they had talked, their hands clasped, the warmth of palm against palm, an hour of closeness and agreement and understanding. Such hours came more and more rarely. This troubled Nell. Why should it be so? Because Rob spent his days fighting, horses, men, weather, the elements, and the bank balance. Mostly he wore an armour of defiance and stubbornness. From out of this he glared and shouted and cracked his whip at everyone, often at her, too. Again, why? The bank balance. She hated to think of it. She leaned closer to the window and looked out, watching a flock of small birds tossing high in the air above the green. The sun was striking the underside of their bodies and they looked like silver butterflies. Bank balance. Long ago she had come to the conclusion that the horses would never pay. Why didn't Rob see it too? And she didn't dare even hint it to him. Was she being cowardly? Was it her duty as a wife? But Rob, he wouldn't be able to take it. Not Rob. As much as Kenny, he set his heart on one thing and could not give it up. That was childish, really. A grown man should be more fluid, able to change and revise his opinions and change his plans. But not Rob. Oh, never Rob. Yes, it was impossible that the horses should pay. The ranch was too far from the markets, and buyers demanded size. Without making an enormous outlay, you couldn't raise a big three- or four-year-old in Wyoming. Owing to the hard winters, lack of help, equipment, buildings, shelter... And what was that thing the income tax man had told Rob once? No ranches in Wyoming made money except dude ranches. Raising costly, purebred horses here just wasn't indigenous to the country. It was a country for, let's see, what did go well here? The railroad, and raising sheep and beef when the markets were good, and some mining. Small ranches ran a little beef, butchered it themselves, and often peddled it in neighbouring towns and caught and broke and sold a few mustangs. Just two things she couldn't face. The bankruptcy and destitution that they seemed to be headed for, and Rob's despair, for it would come. If one came, the other would follow. Already, every day, more harshness in his voice, more bitterness about his mouth, less of the tenderness and humour which had made their youth together long and sweet. What did a woman do? when that went away. Oh, what? Oh, Rob. She bent her head again on the back of the chair. She had faced all this often before, and her habit was simply to push it all to the side of her mind and think of other things. There was this beauty amid which she lived, the open prairie, the calm blue days, the wideness of the plains, elbow room and to spare. Think of that. Think of the boys, happy, well, growing in strength and intelligence and character. And think of that other night, that hour of companionship between herself and Rob, and this morning at breakfast, when his hand had touched her head in passing, saying so much. Sitting there in the kitchen chair, she put her hand up to smooth the hair on top of her head, as if to meet his hand there. At the screen door, Matilda was demanding entrance with peremptory screeches. Paulie looked up at Nell. Shall we let her in? Nell went to the door and opened it, and Matilda galloped joyously in. 
enveloped in a pungent atmosphere of skunk. Neither shouts, nor the clapping of hands, nor energetic pursuit, nor the waving of a broom persuaded her to go out. She leaped upon the cushion of Nell's chair and sat licking the smell off herself with amorous delight. Nell showed her a cracker. Matilda was very fond of butter crackers. She made a leap for it, but Nell was too quick for her. She ran out of doors, closing the door safely behind them both, then stooped and offered the cracker to Matilda. Matilda could never behave like a lady. She stood up on her hind legs, boxed at the cracker with both paws, knocked it out of Nell's hand, seized it, and fled. That's the end of chapter four. Thank you.